think it's about 28 years now. The stag, the same amount of time. It's been absolutely superb. The best car ever. Yeah. It, it's they're very much the social side of things and going and having a good natter and having a bit of a joke. <laughs> I, I decided to join the uh, club. Brilliant social aspect. My dad's been a member for a number of years. And I thought maybe he might let me drive it one day. Uh, meet up with all fantastic people and uh, such lovely times we have. And then we've got this lovely car to drive around. Just over a year we joined. Unfortunately, ours broke down on the way home. So, um, and it had been in a local garage unsuccessfully. And we went up to the club and within two weeks our car was on the road because of the club. But not just that, it's the social side of it. It's, we do look forward to going. Yeah. I've been a member for 26 years in May, so almost 26 years, yeah. And it's been great, I've loved it. Uh, we travel all over Europe with it, we do the, the ESMs. Um, we're off to Ireland this year, so we'll have some fun with that. And it's great, there's a group of us go together, we all get on well. Uh, and it, it's, it's really a fun club to be in. We are a very social club, um, everybody is welcome, we have lots going on that involves the whole family, um, the age range is quite considerable from youngsters right through to people that are well into their 80s, more than 40 areas who organise their local events, the Noggin and Natters and the treasure hunts and the, the weekly events, but we also have national events that everybody is welcome to, to come to. I've made an awful lot of trips for abroad and in the stag ten years ago I did the best thing ever by going on the American trip because it was two and a half thousand miles in two weeks and the car never missed a beat. Stag Owners Club was founded in 1979 to support and preserve just a single model, the Triumph Stag. It was not foreseen that the club would grow into the biggest single model car club in the UK, but such was the interest and enthusiasm for these cars that within a very few years this was the result. Today the club is a well known and respected organisation within the classic car movement, and club livery and regalia is a common sight at shows and events throughout the UK. The club has particularly close ties throughout Europe, which makes ideal grand touring destinations with group trips and visits organised for members annually. It is this sort of social activity, along with a very competitive insurance scheme and the involvement with the remanufacture of obsolete parts, that makes the club such a worthwhile addition to owning a stag. But before taking a more detailed look at the club, we should perhaps take a closer look at the cars. Triumph was a name established in the 1880s for the sale of bicycles. Manufacturing soon followed and then a very successful foray into motorcycle production. The first Triumph car was launched in 1923, but it was the arrival of Donald Healy in the 1930s which led to the beautiful sporting cars that in turn gave the company a highly respected reputation throughout the British motor industry. Triumph cars of the period showed a level of sophistication and innovation rarely seen amongst their peers. 
Despite some well-known purported problems, the Triumph Stag exhibits these same plaudits, most particularly the beautiful starling. But with that smooth, talky V8 engine, hard and soft tops, and the option of automatic transmission, it all makes for a much sought-after grand touring car that had not been produced within the price range previously. I think we were so delighted and surprised really with the design that Miko came up with for the stag, which after all was his own interpretation and was intended as a concept car. To have the possibility of this as a production vehicle was so encouraging that we, we thought we ought to do our best to try and create an interior which, was, um, which reflected the, the sophistication of the outside shape. So within constraints of production costs, we did our best to create a, an ambience which was fitting for the, the whole of the vehicle. And um, overall, I think we did a reasonable job because it seems to have stood the test of time. Bezels now have become uh, chrome bezels as against black bezels which maybe we'd have liked to have done on the original if we could have afforded it. But uh, constraints were that we, we couldn't. But um, looking at this, I realised that the door casings, the, the, the faces around the seats, um, I, I had uh, a, a lot to do with the whole thing, which you tend to forget over the years. <laughs> this, these very simple graphics that you see in the stack subsequently were carried over for the rest of the cars in the uh, Dolomites and later in the uh, TR7s and um, they were unusual for that time because at that period graphics on instruments tended to be rather spidery and uh, intricate and here we try to create a, a more sort of modern uh, block look um, of simplicity, which you could read very easily at a glance. Um, and this simple approach uh, seemed to be approved by the management, and so it got carried through to the other vehicles and became something of a trademark. was the main person that was dealing with the colours and um, we, we, it was a selection but I would put forward the colour proposals and it may be decided upon later. Magenta was my favourite, in fact uh, I, I think it was once said that with the paint that was left over I painted my flat with the colour magenta afterwards but it's not true. <laughs> Well, not many people probably realise that in the 70s, most of the cars that were built by Triumph were exported to the States. And uh, most of those were taken over to California. And the reason why the bright colours are chosen is because the daylight in California is so bright and vivid. I mean, that's why Hollywood is there, because of the light conditions. And um, they were chosen and, and selected because of the American market, basically. And although there were criticism in this country about the colours, I thought they did very well with the States. They, they suited the American market perfectly, I thought. The car was styled by Giovanni Michelotti of Turin, who converted a well-used Mark I Triumph 2000 into the shape we came to know. It was intended to be a one-off show car, but after Triumph's chief engineer, Harry Webster, saw the car during one of his visits to Turin, it was quickly decided to put it into production. It was given the codename of Stag, and this would be the only Triumph model that would see its codename follow it all the way into production and launch. And the idea there uh, was to take the Triumph 2000 and cut the roof off it and make a coupe thing and then fit the two and a half litre fuel injection engine in it so it would be a very nice car. And of course when we 
took the roof off it. John Lloyd's lads in the shop said, this is so weak now, we've got to strengthen the sills. And as work went on to strengthen the bodywork, so the weight went up and the performance went down. So the V8 was created by the engine lads and we put that into stag, which meant that the disc brakes had to be developed to be bigger, axles bigger, uh, rear suspension stronger. And that's how Stag came to happen. It wasn't really designed to be like that at all, in my view. In terms of projected sales, the model was an unknown quantity. Nothing quite like it had been attempted before, and no one really knew how many the company could expect to sell annually. 12,000 was the eventual estimate, although many motoring journalists expected it to be so popular, Triumph would not be able to satisfy the demand. But as it turned out, only 25,939 stags were produced during seven years of production, which ran from March 1970 to June 1977. And yet despite all the problems that beset the car during its early years, it is today amongst the most sought after classic cars ever to wear the Triumph badge. Initially the cars were built at the Triumph Speak factory in Liverpool, with final assembly being completed at Canley in Coventry. But in 1975, after TR7 production got underway at Speak, production of the Stag transferred entirely to Canley. The whole car, apart from the, the drive line and the chassis for the Stag, was built at Speak. Speak number one was body in white. Speak number one built the bare metal shell, the pressings, the, the pretreatments. It was then brought to, to Speak number two where it went through the paint processes and assembly. You had, you know, all the doors, the door trims, the inside, the, the linings, the, the dash, um, all the seats, the hoods, the hard tops were all done at Speak. And then they were shipped to Canley who put them on the chassis and the drive line. It did transfer to Canley as the TR7 was, was building up. Yeah, that's a nice version of the Triumph Stag there. Um, I initially started the development on the V8 engine, which was a two and a half litre version. Um, immediately, a series of engines that Lewis Daughtry had designed for um, the improvement in engine design. Um, we wanted to make a V8 engine that we could also use the same transfer equipment to make a Slant 4 engine, which um, the Slant 4 versions of obviously the ones used in the Sunweb and the Dolomites, <coughs> and eventually in the TR7s. But um, we had a new chap uh, come down from Leyland, a development engineer, a very good one, Chris Sutherland, and um, he took over the V8 and it was changed to 3 litres. And, uh, we made quite a nice job of doing it, but was let down by, as in all car companies, by the, uh, the way they're put together and, um, and service. Two different cylinder head casting manufacturers, and one of them had made a modification to the waterways to make it easier for them, and they never told Triumph that they did it, which caused us a hell of a lot of headaches in um, gasket failures and and that sort of thing. The engine was, was I was going to say, nearly on its limits and it had got to have a good head gasket uh, which the ones that Dennis Barbet used on tests were very good. I, th I got a feeling they were something like perfect circle head gaskets. I may be wrong because I think they used to come from Germany. But whenever you put one of those on, you you fit and forget that uh, the rubbish that the uh, oh, sorry the buying department bought um, they, they led us down right left and centre and the personal knowledge that I have is that a good old friend of ours who who, who ran a stag had got gone into head trouble uh, Dennis said bring the heads in I'll check them for bow and and we'll have a look so anyway, they bought, Joe bought them in and uh, 
Dennis Chapman, he said, no, they're okay. He said, it's just the head gaskets. So he said, I'll, I'll find you two head gaskets in his private little cupboard. He found these two and uh, gave these to Joe and got them fitted properly. And he had no further trouble with, with that car at all. But the slightest lack of compression you know, on that gasket or, around was, was uh, it was really was the uh, Achilles heel uh, of the car that uh, those, I nearly swore then, sorry, gaskets. Originally there were design flaws and the car was sort of rushed to through development but the club and the members that own the cars have actually developed them themselves and the reliability issues are very few now. Many of us do go on the continental trips and the whole family can enjoy the top town burble in those circumstances. I mean it was a hell of a job to squeeze that stag engine in that car. We spent hours doing the intake manifold to get the right airflow to the Stromberg carburetors at the time. It was really was well, very, very tight, you know. Uh, we did look at putting the Rover 3.5 litre V8 in it, which I think would have made a nice car actually, but it meant putting about three or four inches on the length. We did some, do some initial schemes really, but uh, the feedback we got was that Rover didn't want to supply us with the V8. There was supposed to be a bit of a deal where we would take their three and a half litre V8 and they would take our six to replace their rather rough 2.2 litre four cylinder, but it, it never happened at the end of the day. Since those suspect early days, the Triumph V8 has been proven to be a robust and reliable engine. And within the Stag Owners Club there is a wealth of knowledge to assist anyone new to Stag ownership who may have inherited a car with an engine that has not yet been sorted. A good percentage of the original cars have survived and undergone extensive restorations in many cases. This has maintained demand for parts and there is good spares availability as a result. There is no reason any Stag cannot be sorted whatever the problem. Where parts are not available or becoming scarce, the Stag Owners Club Tooling Fund Limited has been a major success. Socktoffel has been responsible for arranging the reintroduction of many obsolete and rarely available parts to guarantee the survival of these cars into the future. Every member of the Stag Owners Club automatically becomes a shareholder of Socktoffel, and this is just one more reason why membership of the Stag Owners Club is a worthwhile addition to the enjoyment of the car. The club has a presence at all the major shows. At the NEC Classic Motor Show in November each year, the impressive stand with a fine display of cars is always a major draw with the public. This is magenta. It may not look quite in this light, it's a bit strange, but it's magenta, it's like a deep purpley colour. Um, and we had to go for magenta because we have a dull white sprint that Paul had done previously, which is bright orange. So we had to have another 70s colour to go with that. We bought the car in 1997, um, it wasn't bad when we got it, but it's taken us 12 years to do it up, because when we got it, we started taking it apart, got the body shop done, and then the two sons that we had then, which were quite small at that point, um, started karting. And if anyone who's ever done motorsport knows that karting takes up all your time and all your money, so we had to stop doing the car for a while. Then they got too big for karting, um, and we went back and we got it finished, and we had it finished for the national show in 2009. We were finished three days before the show, so it was three days hard polishing and we won the concourse, so we were very happy with that, after all that work. The Stack Owners Club have been absolutely wonderful, to be honest. I mean, we, we've been members for years while we've done up the car, and they've been very helpful getting the bits and pieces that we needed. Um, their tooling fund is excellent because they, their stuff actually works. And well, since we got the car finished, you know, we started going to shows with a local club and they've been lovely. They're very keen to welcome new members. We all get together once a month and through the winter for meetings so we know what's going on. We all volunteer to do whatever we like. Um, and they've been very friendly, very friendly indeed. I got my first stag, which was a real problem car, did a lot of work on it, and was never really happy with it. Um, and you do as you do it a lot of times, is you buy another stag, because that's one that's not quite right. So I ended up with three stags, 
Um, did a lot of the events and a lot of the international events, which were great, really good fun. Um, and then decided that I wanted something more modern, so I sold all the stags, brought a Mercedes, and um, missed the Stag Owners Club virtually from day one. And it was the camaraderie, and it was the kind of the events themselves, and the friendliness. So I kept the Mercedes for a year, and then brought Stag again. Um, so that was about six years ago. Um, now I'm back on my second Stag, and really enjoying it, and doing a lot of the international events, and it's brilliant. But I've got a, a couple of daughters, one's three and one's six, and they love it in the back of the car. Um, so in the winter it's all nice and warm because the hard top's on, and it's nice and quiet. Um, but in the summer they love the top down and you can hear them you know, screaming of enjoyment really and they just love the car. They take a lot of mickey out of me, they always, they always play me up and say, oh dad, not a stag again. But they, at the end of the day they love being in it. Oh dad, not the stag again. Well I'm actually comparatively new, I'm in my sixth year. Um, but I don't play with things, so I'm Deputy Coordinator Warwickshire, I'm on the National Committee, I do the Warwickshire website and I love the car to bits. We join in with all the social activities around uh, the Warwickshire area and Leicestershire area. We tied up with Notts Derby as well. We do a lot of the things around there. Um, we do European trips. We've done two years running. We've done the European meetings. Uh, Switzerland in 2010. This year we did Cologne. Two week holidays. Fantastic touring car. That's what it's all about. The first uh, stag event that we went to was the European meeting. It was over in, um, in Germany near Cologne. It was tremendous. We didn't really know anybody before we, um, before we arrived. But straight away, I think it was Leslie, the president, invited us straight in. We were met, looked after, made sure we never sat alone. There was a group of us all the time. Very, very welcoming. Uh, and we felt we belonged straight away. The European meetings for me really encompass everything that's good about the, the Stag Club and the members in it, both, um, both in this country and abroad as well. And uh, through the club meetings we got lots of friends abroad, uh, Germany and Holland as well, uh, Switzerland, just great. The long trips you can do on there just really illustrate how good the car is. It's, it's designed for this and uh, we've easily done five, six hundred miles in a day and you get there and uh, fresh as a daisy and uh, no backache. All the clubs on the continent and ourselves take it in turns to host an event and there's a rotor by which we go through. Um, there's about a hundred cars that turn up on these things and uh, we have a wide age range in the club and everybody is welcome to participate. Uh, yes, over 40 areas um, belonging to the Stag Owners Club up and down the country and, and Northern Ireland as well. Um, there's a website, links them all together, there's also a forum, but mainly it's the magazine and the out and about section. Every area, every month sends in a report, big or small, it all gets in the magazine and everybody can see what people are doing in different areas. Um, it's not only your area that you may be interested in, lots of people read the areas, area reports all over the country and often if you're on holiday down in Devon, look in on the people down there. We also have national events. Um, with the national events moving round, some people link their holidays with it and take a week or so in that area having a good look round. It doesn't matter where you live in the country, you're welcome to go to any area and to any national event and uh, hopefully enjoy yourselves. When we did the major upgrade to the website, I felt before it was all about the car and I think in the earlier days it was very important that it was because people were struggling to get parts, uh, to find out about uh, mechanical things and problems like that. That information is more available now, especially with the internet, so we felt what's more important and, and for me it's the membership, it's the people involved. So we pitched the website very much at the members, what they're doing and all the different activities and we've said it's the member that's important, you don't have to own a stag to be part of this uh, Stag Owners Club community, just interested in the cars. Sometime or another they are older cars, you may need some advice from a technical person. We have 40 years of experience in this club and uh, 
somewhere along the line somebody knows what's wrong with your car and will offer help. Our club forum is a very good way of getting advice very quickly. I think the, the record was eight minutes in a response, but you do have to be a little careful. They are personal opinions and um, obviously the technical panel can't check them quite as quickly as that to make sure that they are suitable for your car. In order to keep the cars on the road, we facilitate the making and manufacture of parts um, through the Sotoffel, through the, the tooling fund which is set up by the club. Each member of the club is a shareholder in that firm and they work with the traders to make sure that the parts are of good quality and available for the members. The Trans Stag is an extremely versatile car and it is also a popular choice for those looking for a stylish car to modify in some form. The Stag Owners Club accepts any member, whatever the preference for their own Stag. It is this variety that in many cases makes a car so appealing, but importantly, these cars can be used by the whole family, which makes it stand apart from Trans out and out sports cars of the day. I find it great, I mean, with the transition, stepping out of a modern car into this one's not, not too greatly different. You know, if you've got all your refinements, you adjust your seat up and down, your electric windows and your power steering. But apart from that, you, I mean, you know you're driving it, it's a proper driver's car, but it's great on all, all the roads, keeping up with the modern traffic. It's quite a good size boot, you know, you can get four people in it, no problem. Children don't get out with too many aches and pains after a run. It's, Pretty good on fuel, even though it's an automatic as well. It's still, still return like 30 to a gallon on a run. Regularly use the car. Lots of um, events organised with the club. It's great to go as a group, see all the stags driving together. Go to the nationals. Been, been to two of the nationals. Gone up as a family. We go and make a weekend of it. Go and stay overnight. Have the roof down at the blanket across their legs with the wind blowing through their hair and that. Have a great time. I'm in the Stag Owners Cornwall Group and uh, we're out on a meeting uh, with 22 stags from Devon, Cornwall and Somerset up at uh, Dinglesteam Fair. Um, I'm the only one with a Rover V8 engine in it, so I'm not, not original. Here we go. All on eBay. The car is in 1972 with a, a Rover V8, as you can see, with an old Brock Carburetta. Uh, it runs really well. It's still mated to an original Triumph Stag um, gearbox and overdrive, which still works. I did put to the Triumph. I added one with the Triumph engine. I say it's, it works well. It works really well. Originally, was uh, instigated by Tony Hart, who was the founder of the uh, Stag Owners Club, and um, with him and the, the men at Ingenuity, they uh, installed all the uh, supercharger with the fuel injection, and it now puts out about 220 brake horsepower, do about 130 miles an hour. BMW limited step diff, uh, rear disc brakes, and um, the suspension's been lowered and makes it uh, ride a lot better, poly bushed and uh, spec shock absorbers. I'm very pleased with it. I like the increased power, it makes the car much more fun to drive. The Triumph Stag will be a presence on our roads for many years to come. And while the Stag is enjoyed by enthusiasts around the world, the Stag Owners Club will be there to support them. 
As time goes on, the club will look to improve the range of benefits membership can bring and promote the cars to an ever wider audience. Can there really be any reason an enthusiast of these cars would not want to be involved?